Welcome everyone. How's the energy in the room? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, thank you. I would like to welcome both our in-person and virtual audience to this session, Managing Data in a Multifaceted Environment. Managing data and analytics across Air Force, Navy, Army, and Marine is no easy feat. So this panel discussion will share insights on challenges, successes, and opportunities to drive change, innovation, and mission outcome. A few housekeeping details uh, before I introduce the moderator. This session is being recorded, and the recording will be made available as part of your symposium proceedings. There will be Q&A at the end, so virtual audience, please submit your questions via Whoa app. And live audience, please raise your hand, and I will bring the microphone over to you. Um, our moderator for this session is Mark Crisco. Mark is the Principal Deputy Director of Acquisition Data and Analytics at the US Department of Defense. His efforts have ignited both philosophical and technological transformation in the department, advancing data-driven approaches across many major programs, a portfolio of $2 trillion in investment across the program lifecycle. With that, Mark. Good morning, all. All right, come on, we could do better than that. This is the last day. You know, I see my distinguished colleagues from the Navy joined us, so we'll talk about them as well, too. Um, I know it's the last day we're in the home stretch. It's been, it's, I want to thank Rich Wang and his team and the efforts associated with this. This has been such a great community for all of us in so many ways from a government and industry perspective to understand where we are, where we're going, where we're trying to go. And I always say this, and many of you have heard this, this is really group therapy. Um, you know, this stuff is hard. It's not easy. Um, when you ask me about, you know, is the Army, Navy, and Air Force represented? Yeah, I think I can cover their equities here a little bit, but not all of them. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. We have a very distinguished panel here uh, representing the breadth. I will talk a little bit about, well, maybe more than a little bit, uh, about where we're going in the data and how it all fits together to move to analytics and drive mission. Uh, we also have Dr. Phil Anton from uh, the ERIC, the Acquisition Innovation Research Center. We stood that up about three years ago to even push the edge of data and analytics. We also have, and I hate when they do it on back to back, Dr. Laura Freeman, uh, who does such a spectacular job in talking about how we're thinking about and how we're piloting and moving data uh, so we can leverage university activities associated with that. We have Mr. Mark Hogemiller from Aon, who's the Chief Transformation Officer here. And last but not least, my favorite Marine in the room right now, uh, <laughs> Bill Parker, uh, who has trained a lot of data science and analytics and really has led thought-provoking. So if you wouldn't mind joining us up, and then we can go through a couple charts here. Uh, I want to put them on camera, too, so to get it off of me, I am not that good to look at. Um, so... Next chart, please. Let's see if we can go. All right, we just did that. I kept my picture from 10 years ago. It's so much easier. All right, so, so you know who's who in the room. Um, uh, but we'll get back to that. Next chart, please. We, we've already covered the abstract, so let's go. All right, so what is the acquisition and sustainment data ecosystem? Uh, we work for the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Sustainment and his role and his responsibility is to oversee the entirety of the defense acquisition system. And the defense acquisition system is not a technology system, it is a bunch of systems. And they have established priorities for us and Congress drives priorities to us, Defense national defense strategy drives it to us and the question really becomes is, okay, so what do we do in that data fabric that's required or the data mesh? And where have we evolved to? Um, I always like saying what we're not. Uh, I am not the chief data and analytic officer for the Department of Defense. I am merely but one of those categories within that whole portfolio representing the acquisition and sustainment community in some regard. 
because uh, the sustainment community is rather big for that. In that data mesh, we have worked on priorities. And we're talking about, <clears throat> as, as was illuminated to you, a trillion dollars worth of resource. Major programs, all programs through all levels. What are we doing? How are we leveraging that data? Because we have to report to Congress. We have to oversee those programs. We have to enable the services to help them and our partnership with our services uh, colleagues have been, frankly, remarkable. And then we have new priorities, new priorities coming to us from Congress, new priorities based upon what the mission needs are of the Department of Defense. How do we manage them and how do we align them? And the data mesh concept that has been evolving over a period of time, and I wouldn't say it's new, uh, has been a good guide for us to bring our data products together. So in that whole stream of data mesh, our contribution to the CDAO is our portion of that data mesh of leading, governing, and aligning that. Um, and I will get a little bit more specific about that. Next chart. So how do we do that? Um, I showed this chart last year. It has evolved a bit. Uh, the undersecretary has to make decisions. The services have to make decisions based upon their authorities. And you know, we've come out of a paper-based world where, you know, we would issue policy, everybody would wonder what, they, what was going to happen next. Well, in the upper left quadrant, we refactored the entire acquisition process and enabled it with processes. Well, underneath that, and the processes of different methods for the, for the services and components to buy faster, we created value streams whether they be rapid capabilities, major weapon system capabilities, whether they be business systems, whether they be software systems, whether they be services. Giving them, it is not profoundly new, but it highlighted that you had the flexibility in the services and programs you could do what they needed to do based upon the commodities that they were buying. And that process was enabled about three or four or five years ago. And in that, the underlying piece of that is the data which is the lower right quadrant of this. What we did in our community of data alignment is looked at all of that and said, stop asking the services for the same things 15 ways. Don't ask them here for what program and don't ask them here for what program. Get two different answers and never be able to reconcile it. So we, in partnership, and I would say this, and, and Ralph is here now working the, out in Albuquerque in the Air Force, and he, he was such a great partner when we really started this. Um, we created alignment. And I was talking a little bit about it at breakfast. We said, here's what we're trying to achieve. And our first question was, or our first comment was, don't go do this. The first question we asked the services, what should we do? We solicited their opinion and their actions of saying, how do we need to look at data and where are you in your journey? And we created an extensive partnership. And Ralph, I'll be forever grateful for your uh, efforts associated with that. But with that, their task to us was work across OSD. Stop those other offices for asking the same question, give it to them once, and they said, Good luck with that. Um, I will say that is always a journey. Use what we have. Tell us what more you need. We can figure it out. And create a data management discipline at an enterprise level where we can contribute to that. Well, why? I will tell you data management is not sexy, but it is certainly the fundamental piece of what you need to do. Because without that, you don't get to where you need to go. Um, many are enamored with the lower right quadrant of analytics, visualization, tools, generative AI. That's where our consumers see it. But without strong fundamentals, they go awry. People don't understand. And it drives the components of data literacy where if they don't understand why we did and what we did, it's just a visual tool. But there is a lot baked into those processes. So data literacy has always been an important role. Well, and why? It's not data for data's sake. It's not visualizations for visualization's sake. It was to enable the undersecretary and, frankly, the services and components 
to do better jobs of reporting their programs, overseeing their programs based upon their authorities, looking at them in an emerging topic that we have in portfolios. And without that mission area, it's just data, just a bunch of visualizations. Next chart, please. So system overview, they always wonder, well, how do you work this all together? Yes, there is a system view. Uh, it's a lovely cartoon that says, in the center hub, we have the Defense Acquisition Visibility Environment, or DAVE, and we work it based upon our core data standards, which we include in the Acquisition Visibility Framework. We share that data with open APIs to the CDAO. We give them mother's milk because we've done the governance piece of it and provide that them for other purposes. Through our partnerships with the Army and Air Force, they have decided, we have not told, that they would use a system called PMRT to use for their environment. Now the Navy has to be different. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> they have our dais, but we see how they are in the family portrait, and ultimately, in the end of the day, and at a senior level, all of this data ends up in Havana, which is the CDAO system for visualization and analytics and where analytics can be performed. But in this day, we've created an ecosystem, a federation of systems and techniques to get to that. Um, and we think about this all the way through of how does that data move? Because when it gets there, everybody forgets about all the due diligence that happened of when it got there. Next chart. Let's talk about innovation. <laughs> I call this the fill chart, but I'm sure he'll be glad to talk about it for 40 minutes. I've limited him to three. Uh, and uh, Phil could talk about it extensively in this. We are part of a major ecosystem. Uh, in the Department of Defense, you think about the planning, budgeting, and execution system. You think about the requirement system. You think about the acquisition system. Everything, virtually everything, goes through the acquisition system. And the acquisition system is not just procurement. And in the procurement, it's everything we like to think about it as big A, all the way where the department is thinking about all their capabilities and how do they bring those things together? How do we use science and technology, engineering, program management, delivery, and delivery of capabilities, sustain those capabilities when they get the systems, and ultimately report to Congress. Feeding this ecosystem and understanding how to do that and enable that through a digital data strategy is no small chore. We do have a foothold in what we've done for two decades of overseeing and seeing programs, but overseeing is not, and having insight is no longer good enough. These systems, programs, and capabilities must work together in the field and, and operate in, in a portfolio, and how do you bring those pieces together? And in that, we have an awful lot of functional stewardship. We have engineers. We have scientists, program managers, logisticians, systems engineering, contracting officials. How do we bring those concepts and create some alignment with that? Because we are not them but we have to figure out how to do this. And I'm sure Phil will talk about how this all fits together and where we start to push the edge, not only to bring capabilities today, but to better understand what we would need to do in our data realm to fill out that. Next chart, and I think it's my last one. It's my new labor of love that I was voluntold to do, uh, the Defense Civilian Training Corps. Um, this past year, um, we've, Congress has been at us for a few years saying, our workforce is not getting, we're not moving fast enough. We're not the employer of choice in some regards. We're not getting the skills. We're not thinking about how the skills fit together. And this past year, they authorized and appropriated and told us, in other words, told us to go get this done. Um, we are right now in the throes of creating a Defense Civilian Training Corps and what a Defense Civilian Training Corps is ROTC, really, for civilians. How do we fill the critical skill sets across the department? 
Uh, they told us that we should use our Acquisition Innovation Research Center as the base to do this. And in that, design curriculum, design projects, to create cohorts, not just give scholarships. Because our workforce of the future, our workforce of the day, if you're an engineer, you better understand a bit about contracts. If you're a contracting official, you better understand engineering. And you better understand technology, you better understand data science, and how do we think about that when both academia and ourselves are siloed in our own regards? And how do we build that future workforce, become an employer of choice, nurture them through college, and work that? Um, we initiated the pilot. Uh, we've been pretty much from a zero to 90 start in the past three months. We have four schools that are piloting across the nation. One, Virginia Tech, North Carolina A&T, Purdue, and Arizona. So we've touched all four corners. We built upon, um, asked them to help us figure out how to do that. Uh, as of today, we were told to do this by 24. Um, we are a bit ambitious. Uh, we have currently over, I think it's like a, um, close to 200 applicants. Um, and, and, we hmm? and, we cut it off. and we cut it off at 200 applicants and uh, we will onboard 12 initial cadre for DCTC we call them cohort zero um, so if you're in a service in DOD um, while we've not figured out all the things we will have some candidates that we have not made them mandatory service in the first one their give back to us has helped us figure out how to talk to the next generation. Um, but I will tell you at the end of the uh, year, we'll have 80 students. Uh, the Army has already said, I'll be glad to take all of them. Uh, <laughs> <I want some. laughs> the Navy, we've talked to SOCOM, I've talked to Ms. Verdeen back there, she has her hand up. Uh, you know, I, I, I told my boss, uh, Ms. Skeen, I said, it is not a problem this first round. I said, we have so much demand. And thinking about a student that we have not only taking advantage of the university infrastructure and the skills that they have, rounding out their skills, telling them how to work in this enigma that we call the Department of Defense, nurturing them, creating a camaraderie among them, and having them ready to go on day one will be really remarkable. We have a lot of congressional interest in that, and. The way I think about it in, in the portfolio that I lead and all these people represent, uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I don't know, I'm very fortuitous. Uh, working with data and analytics, working with innovation, and working with the future workforce. Because there's only so much we can do in our tours. How do we lay the planks for that transition that needs to occur as we all in this room continue the journey? Um, I talked more than I wanted, Phil. You didn't shut me up. <laughs> um, but I will be glad to do that. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, I don't know, who wants to go first? Okay. <laughs> I volunteer. <laughs> Phil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next, uh, or at least next, go to the last the chart because I pull up their pictures. Uh, uh, one more, there you go. Uh, so you can see who they are and where they're from. Uh, please introduce yourself, um, long or short, or short. Be, be efficient. <laughs> uh, we, we have a lot of fun. Uh, these are some of the best people on the planet and I'm very privileged to work with them. So Dr. Anton, let me, let me kick it off forever to you and let you go first. Hi, I'm, I'm Phil Anton. I'm the chief scientist at this Acquisition Innovation Research Center. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by training, uh, computational neuroscientist, policy analysis, spent six years in the, in the Pentagon, so I've got a good sense of uh, what's going on uh, in there. But uh, I'll probably dive in or I'll have to pass because I'm almost out of time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and he doesn't yes. say, you know, Pull up my slides uh, a Mark Crisco colleague out of therapy, too, you yes. know, so. Go ahead, okay. Phil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, so, Laura, introduce yourself. Go ahead, Laura. Okay. Laura Freeman, I'm the Deputy Director of Virginia Tech's National Security Institute um, and a statistician by training, so very excited to be in a room of people that are enthusiastic about data. Um, and I'll be talking about some of our workforce intersections with DOD data strategy. 
Go ahead. So good morning. I'm, I'm Hoagie. I'm the uh, Chief Transformation Officer at Aon. My background is I retired from the Navy as a contracting officer. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm uh, kind of, my background is it got me into doing data, but I'm going to kind of provide the perspective of the, some of the things that we've been doing in supporting our federal clients in their data management journeys. Bill Parker, um, by education would be IT software with a focus in project management. Uh, it's interesting when you get that label of IT education, people expect you to know things. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had to expand and take um, additional training in data science. I teach at Defense Acquisition University primarily, and what we do is we train the 160 to 180,000 military and civilians, mostly civilians, in how to manage our large development contracts and how to, you don't just go and procure an aircraft carrier, right? Um, even our boots, you know, we often have special requirements. So we develop things. And I primarily teach the program managers for our largest programs. In order to t stay in touch with evolution of training and education, I also teach here uh, in the Boston area, Boston University, a graduate course in IT project management, and I've taught sometimes at George Mason in their MBA program. In a really, really brilliant move, Congress directs us every five years to go embed in an organization, an acquisition organization actually doing this, so we can stay current. And right now, I am serving six months with the Navy in their business, port business systems portfolio, which is interesting because the Ardeus feeder system <laughs> that feeds a lot of our data <laughs> up at the uh, department level, I'm now getting to see the struggles they have and challenges in getting those programs to feed the data. We'll talk later so I can a better understand. <laughs> right. um, Dr. Anton. Great, can I get my slides up, please? We're working on it. Oh, slides. Slides? <laughs> yes, or, or I'll just talk. We have more slides. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I, I love the title, Multifaceted Government Organizations. Doesn't that sound like a really easy place to solve problems? Yeah. So I was just going to highlight a few aspects of how do you actually grapple with it if you go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, in dealing with a relationship in a complex organization like that. So multifaceted is the way I'll talk about it, but this is just sort of the practical aspects of it. So the Department of Defense has had a uh, data strategy since uh, 2020, um, uh, laid out some very useful principles. The question is how do we take those principles and, and make them real? So I'm going to talk about three general areas today, sort of laying out what the strategy means for acquisition, because acquisition is, is a level down from the department-wide uh, uh, strategy, uh, identifying some practical techniques, I'll highlight a few of those for you, and then, you know, how do we make it real? We can't boil the ocean because it really is such a big organization, uh, but we're looking at applying some uh, actual use cases. We'll take something uh, as initial uh, areas to start in. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is the chart. I will spare you and not go through it, but <laughs> think about it as a system, right? It's the defense acquisition system. It's the DOD system. So we're trying to think about it systemically. What are the inputs and the outputs? And then how can data uh, facilitate operation within that system and ultimately the output uh, and outcomes that we're caring about uh, uh, you know, for national security in, in, in our case? So thinking about it differently, uh, the more than just data and bits and bytes and documents, trying to think about other opportunities such as models. Can we use models and supporting data as a richer representation of, of the items that we're thinking about acquiring and capabilities out there? This is a list of some of the challenges uh, that, that uh, the department is facing, uh, probably facing in a lot of other organizations. I'll just highlight a few of them in a, in a very stovepiped uh, uh, entities, really fa focusing on their particular areas, you know, any bureaucracy has to do a divide and conquer, which introduces these complications of interactions. So how do we actually deal with that uh, limited uh, interoperability? Uh, it's hard to motivate the ultimate end goal, right? We need capabilities for national security. What does that mean? I'm a contracting officer here, the things I get uh, graded on. So how do we think about 
those incentives and we have, have some uh, research going on in there. Um, how do we improve that kind of transparency when you get a lot of love if you're having some challenges? You might, might probably more uh, wish that people would leave you alone and let you solve the problems, but at some point we do have to share uh, it, it is government. Um, and there are reasons why that are, that are motivating some of these uh, disincentives to share. Uh, security is one of them. You know, what, I, well, this is national security. How do we deal with and grapple with uh, those particular areas? How do we deal with trust um, as, as we're going through it? So, so these are some of the challenges. Next slide, please. Um, and so these are some of the techniques that uh, we've come up with from uh, talking to industry, looking at academia, uh, really thinking about, again, incentives. How do we tackle them directly? How do we understand the reasons why someone really doesn't want to share it? And in some cases, you know, there are they're, uh, uh, good reasons for it. Maybe it's pre-decisional. It is, really isn't ready to share. Uh, maybe they're worried about what, what are you going to do with my data? Are you going to make me look bad? Uh, or, or are you going to help me? Or are you actually going to do something that really does facilitate it? Um, thinking about innovation and agility, how do we think about new ways of using data and information so that it really does provide the fruits of what we're trying to do, the visions that you know, we all are, are thinking through, um, and then grappling with things like trust and security. You know, it really is, is, is a valid concern, so can we develop enclaves and, and other secure areas uh, for dealing with it? And then ultimately moving out and taking action, and then stepping back and measuring whether we're getting performance that we need. Is, is all of this, you know, just another fancy way of saying, well, well there's more that could be done. It's a bureaucracy. We'll, we'll, we'll create it, or are we actually having an impact? So at some point, can we step back and say, how are the data and the information flows leading to better decisions and ultimately better outcomes for national security? So next slide, please. So these are some of the case uh, of areas of application that we're thinking about. Uh, we're still developing it with, uh, with Laura and Mr. Chris Mo and, and, and Hoagie uh, and thinking about particular applications. So I'll highlight some of these uh, areas, thinking about applications and capabilities in terms of digital acquisition. So uh, there's a lot going on in the sort of systems engineering world. Some of you may be familiar with where we're trying to do model-based engineering at that level. Well, that's all down at the particular program level and dealing with uh, support contractors and their development, natural uh, uh, development of those capabilities. Those models could be useful for other higher level questions and decisions. So how do we get them? How do we store them? How do we mandate a storage? Can we uh, do that in a way that's uh, centrally available? So even though a program is really developing some capability, go off and build a truck or an aircraft or something. Um, at some point, if we're thinking about broad capabilities and portfolios of capabilities, wouldn't it be great if we could have those models as a much richer representation of it? Well, to do that, now I need to have you know, data management, data structures, policies, and places for dealing with that. So that's uh, one example. Uh, and then I'll just hi highlight the uh, SBOM as another one. So you may be aware there's a presidential directive for uh, dealing with a software bill of materials uh, uh, out there. So we're wondering at some point, on the acquisition side of the house, how do we deal with it? There's a data and analytics aspect of that, ultimately, to inform higher level analyses and decision making. So that's another case where uh, it, 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 it makes sense to proceed. Um, and then finally, the last one on risk. So we've been dealing with risk and risk reporting in the department for years. And what do you get? Oftentimes, you get a little risk cube. Um, it's very interesting. The problem is when people read it, they say, ah, oh, well, you know, red is bad. I have high risk. Well, I'm sorry, we're in the Department of Defense. Risk is our job, right? We have to deal with risk and we have to take risk because uh, we need to move forward and, and, and we can't just eliminate them. We have to manage them. So are there ways of representing risk in, and risk decisions in a way that, that uh, oversight and decision makers can see and understand the decisions that are being made? Maybe we're gonna accept that risk and we're gonna often take it because we need to move faster. We need to get capabilities out uh, to the warfighter. Um, and in other cases, no, we actually do need to drive that risk down and deal with it. So how do we present that and reason through that information? It's you know, a much richer way of thinking about uh, risk-related data. Uh, next slide, please. So just some closing thoughts. Really trying to think, how do we get beyond the abstract of principles? Principles of sharing, so the Deputy Secretary of Defense has a memo out, say, ah, the data are, are, are a department-wide asset. Well, okay. How do I get beyond that and say, what do we share? How do we share? How do we protect it? And move through that, that area. 
How do we address ultimately these? Don't ignore the, the bureaucratic barriers. You can't just tell someone, look, you're going to do the data sharing because I told you to. Well, I have a data risk issue. I have these other problems. It's going to you know, distract me from other work. There, there's a cost associated with it. How do we think through those together, those barriers uh, to implementation, selecting the, the appropriate data, the really important data that we do need for oversight um, at that level and dealing with the issues I mentioned earlier, security uh, and, and, and trust, and make certain that we're using the data appropriately to ultimately help the, the warfighter. Uh, and then ultimately, the, the, the don't boil the ocean comment that uh, Mr. Crisco uh, brings up uh, all the time, but actually can we take measured progress? So we're, we're looking at areas where we can take initial steps, let's take them on, make some progress, you know, show the value, and then, and then continue to move forward. So, over, time back. <laughs> I, I'm, a, you get an A. I get an A, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. The little red light is starting yeah, yeah. to go up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. You're, you're, you're a great partner. Uh, Dr. Freeman. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Oh, and that's not me. Uh, <laughs> no. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Huh. Is that these, you? Might, these might have been backups. Can you go a little further? Oh, it could be backups. Yeah, these Keep are going. backups. Keep, Keep going. going. Keep going. Okay. You know, there you have to have backups. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was, um, so, um, I want to build on what Phil talked about a little bit in terms of uh, not boiling the ocean. Um, it's a great way of making progress, but in my experience working with students in academia, giving them a concrete problem that has real impact, where they can have impact, is also your best recruiting tool. Um, and it's super fun. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is how within the ERIC and in partnership with the DCTC program that Mark talked about, we're working to build academically rigorous research, but have that mission focus and bring that mission focus to our students so they understand what a career in the Department of Defense might look like for them. So I'm gonna talk kind of in, in tandem about both our, the access and the data and how we get our students engaged, how we get our faculty, because um, faculty are how you get the students engaged in academia, um, but also how we think about developing the next generation of our workforce to come help us solve these really challenging data problems. Next slide. Um, so the, the big challenge is how do we start to engage academia in a more systematic fashion? There are tons of things going on across the Department of Defense and engagement with academia, um, but we're very specifically focused on DOD's data strategy, strategy and in particular, ANS's implementation of the data strategy that Phil talked a little bit about how we're thinking about implementing. Um, so I want to start with, you know, both DOD and academia have a lot to bring to this conversation. Um, so in academia, there's a lot of the, probably everyone in this paper read the FAIR paper that was published in Nature many years ago, and that it was really a springboard for a lot of the things. It was a collaboration between academia, government, and industry, looking at what was required for data, making it findable, accessible, and operable, and reusable. I really wish it had been FAIRs, because secure is so important, <laughs> um, that maybe we could have all just settled on it. But um, it's led to a lot of great thinking in terms of what those qualities we need for data going forward. And so there's a lot of great thinking in academia. And where academia has gone with that is in the term of reproducible research. Now anytime you're publishing a paper, there's lots of journals that want you to publish your data, publish your models, so that anyone could take that and reproduce that. And I think there's some lessons learned that we're learning there um, that would translate over into DOD thinking. Of course, what academia is developing new methods, analysis tools, new research, and that innovative thinking. Um, DOD, of course, brings the really hard challenges, really important challenges, um, and connecting those challenges with academia has multiple virtuous outcomes. So I already kind of hit the, the recruiting aspect. Um, I personally had that experience in my career um, and want to bring that experience to as many people as possible. The, the real impact you can have as a statistician, as a data scientist, as an IT professional when you help solve these pr problems. Um, but more importantly, it brings awareness into academia, into our faculty on what are the big challenges and how can they start to address them. And again, new methods. Um, so the keys to success that I'm going to hit today and we'll come back to in my concluding thoughts is the most important thing when trying to do these engagements is that clear problem with an operational impact. Um, and then follow that up with the ability to actually help solve it with data, <laughs> quality data. Um, and then finally, having a decision maker that's willing to engage and implement those solutions 
Um, all of those are really necessary to, I think, kind of complete the circle of having impact, engaging students, engaging our faculty. Next slide. Um, so I won't spend much time on this because Mark already covered it really well, but did want to highlight two aspects to it. This is not just a scholarship program. We're going to be engaging our students in solving real problems, these innovation challenges. Um, and also that um, the Congress really emphasized data-driven decision making. So I put some of the, um, the NDAA conference language up there that hit on it evidence-based data-driven decision making to improve these outcomes. Um, and I think that's just critical. Um, it needs to propagate through all of our academic disciplines. But on the flip side, we're seeing this in academia as well. Every one of my engineering students wants to learn Python. They want to learn data structures. And this is not something that was the case a few years ago. Um, so finding ways to weave across all these different academic disciplines, the connective tissue of data-driven decision making will be something we pilot in DCTC. Next slide. Um, ooh, sorry, this one got a little um, blurred up. But the point of this one is that we have to also break down barriers. Um, controlled unclassified information is a challenge. Getting into the real problems probably needs to be done at at least that level to make sure that we really understand the context of the problems that we're trying to solve. And so we're tackling that through infrastructure with um, ANS. And so the Defense Acquisition Research Collaboration Innovation Environment um, is what we're um, standing up to break down these barriers. So it's a multi-institution, could have industry engaged, could have FFRDCs, UARCs engaged, um, collaborative environment at that CUI level where we've worked through the processes to get multiple organizations involved, including our government partners. Um, and essentially, it's, I won't go into too much detail, but you know, with any kind of data architecture, what we're looking at is <coughs> the data the analysis capabilities, and the ability to have multiple people integrated in solving problems in the, in the environment. But also we want it to be interoperable, or at least compatible, with DoD platforms. So if we build a new solution, we can you know, containerize it and ship it over to Advana or ship it over to PRMRT. And so we're working right now to, on these use cases, having these standard deliverables that allow the interoperability of our solutions to the use cases to be deployed in other environments as well. Next slide. Um, and so some of the benefits we've seen from having this um, uh, collaborative environment, or one was the Data Grand Prix that we at ran last year, DLA and the Marine Corps Aviation um, sponsored two projects where we were able to engage academics from across multiple universities. We had seven universities and 46 different researchers involved in solving these problems. Um, where they brought new kind of student thinking and faculty thinking into how we solve um, the challenges that DLA and Marine Corps Aviation provided, we were able to do it at the CUI level, provide brief outs to the decision makers, and really, I think the biggest impact there was just the exposure to these faculty members. And from our perspective, in terms of who engages in research, people showing up for this was like, oh, you're interested in defense research? Great, we'll work with you more. <laughs> um, so a, a good application of how having this collaborative environment promotes all of the things we've been talking about. Next slide. Um, and I'll conclude with just some, I, because it's a data conference, like no data conference is complete without an XKCD comic, right? Um, <laughs> but wanted to really foot stomp. Um, this one is, um, it really resonates with me as someone who also does a lot of work in machine learning and AI. And I've said I've been down the big data rabbit hole one too many times where you know, people say, well, we have all this data. There must be something interesting in there. There is not. Um, <laughs> and you will burn out um, all of your favorite data scientists looking for that needle in a haystack. Um, so this is just a comic that really resonated with me. And <laughs> OK, we'll just keep over-engineering the machine learning to find something in the data. Um, but really, in thinking about how we engage the next generation workforce, how we solve really hard problems with data science. Um, it takes a team. It takes the decision makers um, who are willing to leverage analysis that comes out of the data, the problem owners, the problem solvers, researchers. Um, and where we really want to focus that team, if we can get all that team together, is on problems that will have impact. And finding that intersection of those problems with impact and quality data is going to lead to success when you're doing these types of pro solving problems. And with that, I will turn it over for our next panelist. <laughs> next. Uh, take so, control, take control, Laura. So, uh, first, before we start, who in here is from industry? <laughs> industry. 
and the rest of you are from government? Okay, so we're going to do a little compare and contrast, and this is, and so one of the things, this is the last time Mark's ever going to let me talk without uh, looking at my slides ahead of time. <laughs> so we're going to play, I'm going to lighten it up a little bit, and we're going to play a little game called Dwordle. Uh, as you notice, we like to make up words in the Department of Defense, and you've probably been talking to people this week, and they've things, said things like Darcy and uh, okay. Fairs and other things, and you're like, what are they talking about? But it helps us conceptualize things. And so we, I mean, th you're familiar with these, like NASDAQ. ISO, STEM, some of you probably remember uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Does anybody <laughs> remember what NASDAQ actually stood for? No. So you get bonus points if you can make up a word, get it uh, colloquialized, but nobody remembers what it was. So it's the National Association, Security, National Association of Securities Dealership Automated Quotations. So before it was ever electronic forum, it was just automated quotations. But we've, it's stuck into something else now. Next slide. So one of the things I wanted to, and we're going to make up our own wordle today. Uh, so one of the things that is, we're in the ESG track, and you that are from industry are like, okay, uh, next slide. You know, that's that environmental social governance. For us that are in, you know, that come from the government side, you're like, what is that concept? Well, this goes into about corporate investing, investors looking at corporations, looking at their environmental posture, social and governance. Goes back to like the late 60s, took, uh, got headwind in the early 2000s as environmental things came more to the forefront. And so I was like, what does that have to do with why we're in this track? But it turns out that in the government, you also have an ESG track. Next. Uh, so um, just a minute, back, back, back one. So I was at a uh, conference in the uh, late fall in a, um, a security analyst from um, Baird Investment Banking. I was doing a panel on the national defense strategy in 22, 2022 of what was going on and from an investment perspective. Uh, remember in February 22, Russia invaded um, Ukraine, and so he said from the aerospace and defense industry, it went from being environmental, social, and governance to energy, security, and government. Most likely for those who are, who's providing energy, who's providing security, it has weapon systems, and who's providing government services. But it also got me to thinking it's the same thing that's in Mark's portfolio today and some of the things that we're doing in the Department of Defense is uh, right now we're having to look at our future weapon systems and what is its energy sustainability. So we're working with that, um, that uh, particular office is how are we going to measure those future weapon system programs and how they're going to be more capable using less posture of energy because in, in, you know, it's not guaranteed that we're going to have all the assets that we need in the next war. Um, you've already heard Laura talk about security, you heard Phil talk about security. So we do a lot of grappling around and you do a lot of grappling around security. Not only from are we protecting classified and sensitive information, but also wrestling with, are we over protecting information that doesn't need to be protected? So we look at it from both perspectives. And then I like to call it government. Uh, for our, um, you know, people say, well, in corporations, you have board of directors. Well, we also have one in government. You all have a board of directors, 535 members of the board, 100 from the Senate, and 435 from Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they actually establish laws that recommend our funding levels and spending policies. So we don't get it unless the board of directors approves it. And we have about 26 million uh, stockholders called U.S. taxpayers, which many of you are. And so we have that same perspective. But I think, next slide. So we're going to make up our, our own world here. So what do you think our next framework is going to be going forward? <laughs> make it into a word. Sage. Next slide. Sage. Sage. <laughs> next. One of the things that's common amongst both of us, all of us, is artificial intelligence is the biggest thing we're doing. And not from the technology standpoint, but what about those policies? I'm hearing the word, and I'm looking forward to seeing this thing called guardrails. Um, last time I was in a car, when you hit the guardrail, it was not a good thing, so I'm not <laughs> sure what that is, but from that perspective. And so I think both of us on either side are going to be having to deal with this in the future uh, and looking to the CDOs or how are we going to do this, both from the responsible use and innovation, but also protecting the data, both for the corporation and for citizens' data. I mean, every day something else pops up there. we got the White House doing an initiative. The EU is already putting their initiatives in place. Not to be outdone, Senator Chuck Schumer's got a thing in place, and I'm going to give him credit because he actually um, called it SAFE, Security Accountability Foundations and Explained. So 
Um, he actually made up the dwordle himself. But you can go back now to your senior leadership and to your corporations and say it's the chief data officer's responsibility to give you sage advice. So, <laughs> so you can take that back with you. Next slide. Um, you can move on. So the uh, move on one more. No, not so, Voltus. So <laughs> Phil already put this up there. He, he snuck it in there. He had the words up there with Voltus, and it's a very simple concept. As he mentioned, the uh, chief data officers now the CDAO, and when we talk about in the Department of Defense, the CDAO, um, you may think of it as the chief data and analytic officer. No, in Department of Defense, we have to have an acronym that means something different. So it's the chief digital and artificial intelligence officer. Um, they, they saw early on the need in Congress, or the early on need to take our CDA office in what was called the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, put them together to get the CDAO. Phil had mentioned in the data strategy that the Deputy Secretary Hicks signed out that talked about this concept of Voltus and as you roll out your strategies, making data visible, accessible, understandable, linked, trustworthy, interoperable, and secure. So you're looking at that and go, okay, that's a good data framework. Why is that important? One of the things that helps is when we go out and talk to senior leaders, who don't want to talk about data mesh, data framework, and you know, all those other things, you can talk about very simple terms of what this needs to be and have, making data visible, accessible, understandable, linked, trustworthy, interoperable, and secure. I remember I said you get bonus points if you make a word up that nobody remembers the underlying thing. Well, we're already seeing this, that Voltus itself becomes a thing upon himself, and we'll get called to a meeting and say, um, Mark, can you help make this memorandum Voltus? What are you talking about? Well, I saw on the strategy it has to be Voltus compliant. Do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> no, uh, I know, but I, I know it's Voltus. And so it's actually had a bad thing, but we can then break it down about getting all the elements from that perspective. So, but Mark, I'll give it back all to right. Bill. Yeah, no, you didn't give back any time. We should have put a timer on Mark <laughs> here. Uh, <laughs> All right, you got five minutes, because I do want to leave 10 minutes for those that are in, in virtual so we can have a dialogue. So. Bill, okay. no pressure. Go fast. I'm in Three training, so I have to take a moment to train Hoagie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hitting the guardrail is bad. <laughs> if you're on that mountain road and there is no guardrail, it's catastrophic when you go <laughs> off the road. <laughs> okay. Um, training in the area of, or error of big data and AI becomes very, very challenging and we go to all kinds of sources, right? We curate as much as we develop. And you can get good training in a lot of places. If you want to know about the ethical issues associated with data's use in artificial intelligence, believe it or not, John Oliver, who's the, uh, comedian developing, delivering the news on HBO. So fair warning, he uses too many colorful adjectives, but does a really nice job in about 27 minutes of talking about some of the issues. Um, with data in the application, you have a little more time, an hour. Uh, there's something called the AI dilemma. You can go out on YouTube and find it. I'll take a little clip to just demonstrate I take a little from their presentation to help demonstrate how fast artificial intelligence is now moving and what a challenge it is to keep up with the training and especially training in data because bad data equals bad decision making. And when you put AI in that, catastrophic decision making. If we don't put in guardrails, thank you for that. Um, also data science, is not one thing. It is a lot of disciplines, as you can see on the slide. And we need to build data teams, and we need to be smart about building data teams, especially when it comes to the term data scientist, right? Um, next slide. This is what I took from the AI dilemma, and it, it's their information. Prior to 2017, you were making incremental progress and it was different if you were doing speech recognition or you were doing robotics or image generation and they were making small incremental progress. Then in 2017, it was like the matrix. Next slide, please. It was like when he stopped seeing 
the images and all the bad guys running around in the uh, virtual world, and he actually saw the code behind it, the zeros and ones. And what happened here is they recognized it's all language-based, whether it's spoken word, whether it's graphics or computer code, and that's when these generative, large language, multimodal models came out, the Gollum models, as they say. And what's scary about that is now the speed of change has just rocketed. Next slide, please. Um, I'm an old guy. How can you tell? I still like wearing a tie. I think there's only three of us, you, I, and that guy that you know went to take it off. Um, <laughs> And the last time I wrote code was COBOL. And I think they, they like stopped teaching that in college in the 80s. Oh. So what I've done in order to better understand what we're doing with data analytics, I took an intro course in both Python and R. So when it comes to these languages, I'm a rookie. I tried getting it to write code in R for me in chat GPT, I wasn't good enough, but Bard, I got it to do so, and shout out to my statistician, I asked it to write code for me for multivariate analysis of variance with two categorical independent variables and three dependent variables. Bam, it generated it. Here's the problem for us going forward and the real challenge is I'm a rookie. How do I know that's correct? How do I know when all these data generated answers aren't hallucinating, as they like to say, with the, the new AI? I was able to take this and put it in Notepad++, which very cool about learning languages today. It corrects your syntax, and it was correct. But in training, oh, AI is going to do the simple tasks, so we'll do the really complex tasks. If we don't grow the people to be the experts to know when it's incorrect, we're going to be at the mercy. And all of this is based on where the data is coming from. Next slide. Um, we're starting to do advanced analytics within Advana. We're just starting to get there in defense. Um, you know, of course, we weren't using Gollum models. We were happy with natural language processing, right? Uh, we would take all the reports from a PM and based on the language they used, we could actually forecast with pretty good accuracy whether their program was trending up or starting to trend down in cost and schedule and scope. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just know when you're talking about building a data science team, and, and I've seen this in a couple bad ways. Oh, we hired a data scientist, and I went over and talked to them, and they knew R, they knew Python, they knew machine learning. What were we having them do? Build dashboards and click. <laughs> a, you're paying too much for that data scientist talent, and you're not employing them. So you're not getting the benefits, their skills are atrophying. You need to understand who you're hiring because that term gets associated with a data engineer, which is in this room, somebody we need, the data analyst or data scientist who has the statistical knowledge and the programming knowledge, and then a visualization specialist who is somebody that you know can make click or Tableau work for you. We need to understand who we're hiring, and where the overlaps are, because you're not going to find the person that knows it all, at least not very well. I think that's it for me. All right, I'm going to stop you because we got six <laughs> minutes here. All right, you can, I debated in college, so you can really give us fast questions, we'll turn them around quickly, we'll, we'll maintain the arguments. Any, anything from anybody uh, virtually, somebody's going to have to help me virtually, or anybody from in the audience, please. I was going to ask about this digital modeling. Can you tell us what you mean by that? SysML, UML models, what? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Yeah, the models that the engineers are using to build the actual okay, system. Thank you. Taking it wasn't clear for your description. Yes, sir. 
Hi, thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Amy Grace Pratt and Whitney. Um, one question I have: Are you considering the way that uh, changing the way um, we contract? For example, a lot of our C drills are asking for PDF files, and yeah, you know, and even if you asked for data in a way that was like a data product that could be interchangeable, even the work um, specification that would have to identify collecting the data to enable us to be able to produce it in that way. Any thoughts? Yeah, yes. So <laughs> there are lots of discussions with the contracting folks about what exactly information they need. Do they have to change anything on their side? And a lot of what they're saying is, yeah, but the engineers have to tell us how to describe the deliverables. So there is a lot of movement afoot on changing those contract mechanisms so that we get the information in the, in the way we need it, not the standard way that the sigils are written today. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so getting data, you know, Cape data, for example, um, we've really done for years on, on getting understanding their costs, but uh, uh, continuing to gain information on that because that that is very helpful as we think of the future, as well as the current systems. A couple notes on that. Uh, the technology is to the point where you give me a PDF, I can scrape that data, and put it in a format I need. There's other. There's also this problem that I see on both sides, and I have to train students on this. We're still using. PowerPoint, similar to providing a report in PDF, why aren't you using live data? Mm -hmm. They'll say they're worried about the machine going down. Yeah. What they're worried about is somebody digging into the data and asking more questions and having more inquiries than just giving the report. That goes on both sides and what I tell the students is, they have the data. Would you rather them look at it when you're not there or view the live data when you're there to add context? I, I think on that PDF, we can get there. It's going to take time. And cultural time and getting people to accept it on both sides. Yeah, I think that's a complex problem. While we're talking about it and thinking about it, we've been clear in some of our, our engagement with the services. EVM has really been probably where we've been the deepest. It, one, it's a complex matter, and sometimes the dialogue is, oh, just write me a clause, or just write me a seed drill. Well, the question is to do what? So I think there's a lot of things that we have to mature in our thinking, and by working with industry, I th I, we're thinking about it, we're trying to tackle that, and the issue really becomes is, we also have to understand what we've asked for now, too, because that requires a difference on our side and even accepting and managing that data at an enterprise level. And just to build on Bill's point, you know, now SecF, um, when he was AT&L and now the Deputy Secretary, we do go live with that data. Some of it's more live than others. Um, you know, I don't think the great fear is, um, you know, what do they do with it? I mean, we do hear it from the services, and I'll just pick on the Navy since the Navy's sitting up in front of us. Uh, it's not that fear, it's oftentimes that people haven't looked at it before it goes live. They've not been paying attention, they've been thinking about it in old school, oh, I just put it in there. Nobody looks at that. <laughs> well, now we are. And for different purposes, we're really not trying to replicate their roles, we're trying to do a different role. Look at portfolios and think about that. Other questions, Any Sorry. other questions? Any from the web? Um, oh, you yeah, got it. Question. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your presentation. Mark, thanks for inviting for this session. It, it's like, you know, very enlightening to see like, you know, how complex you, you are actually handling. So my question is, um, how are you addressing the generational cultural barriers? I see you guys are building a DCTC program, but again, the old way of thinking is there, like, you know, our PDFs, PowerPoint. So how are you bridging that gap? If you, any one of you can actually address that. Go ahead. Uh, I, <laughs> my biggest concern is in the area of security. And I teach young college kids, we have interns. They're so used to their entire lives being out there on social media. Their thought is, ah, pff, everybody knows everything anyway. Why are we bothering to protect? Which, <laughs> 
somebody in our business, that makes me very nervous. And, and how to strike that balance is very, it's very culturally challenging. So a little bit of small batch whiskey, I like to say it. It's one person at a time, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, you do a product and you, if you have a data scientist or somebody that's very talented or in the manipulation and understands all the rhythms of pulling it together, you do 85 or 90% of their job, you hand it to them, you say, here's how it works and here's what it does and let them carry it forward. Um, some generational gaps we'll never be able to bridge um, and some things we're building for really next generation and I think that's why we have to get through that because um, some people are not going to be willing to take those skills. You know, Bill went off and learned new skills. I go off and learn new skills. I find that fascinating. That is not the entirety of the workforce. Uh, and the question really is, is can we build planks and on-roads? And we're, it's going to require some help. So if you're a data scientist, you're a data analyst, in your, your realm, your job is not only to do your job. Your job is to help that end person do their job better and help them understand why. And some of that's hand-to-hand -hand combat right now. Yeah, we're also doing a lot of micro-credentialing and learning and literacy learning so that you know, existing workforce can understand what the new workforce is telling them and, and they're not either talking past each other or misleading each other. And we need to listen to the new workforce. Uh, example, we mentioned earned value just a second ago. We have an entire industry for earned value. Here at Boston College in their MBA program, they dropped managerial and cost accounting. They don't even teach it anymore. Instead, they're teaching them R, Python, SQL query language, and machine learning because we're moving past some of that, and I think we need that fresh thought to help us move. And I have a question. As you are training and cultivating these future data leaders, how much emphasis is put on soft skills, emotional intelligence, people, you know, behavior yeah. and so on, because I, I, I hear a lot about technological skills, data science, data engineering and everything, yep. I want to... That's a great question, and I think a multifold answer, but um, I think most of the outside of the classroom activities that we do are soft skills. Um, we're really focused on interdisciplinary teams um, and doing experiential learning projects, which brings students from multi-academic disciplines together to solve hard problems. Um, and teaching them about question asking, leadership, how do you engage a, a, this kind of team, how do you go talk to people outside your comfort zone, um, all of those types of things to be successful. And also security things, like what you should not put on your social media platform if you want to go work in the DoD. <laughs> but yeah, all of those, I think, kind of the, the holistic student experience is really important. It is not necessarily tackled by traditional academic backgrounds, and so through DCTC, through some of the capstone projects that we do, we bring our students in contact with the actual problem owners, which again kind of helps that generational transfer of information as well, because it's the people that own the problems that are in senior leader roles that are coming back to work with the students, and the students are learning how to be a professional through those types of experiences. Great. I want to hear security 100 times. <laughs> yeah, I want to build on that because it is, and it'll be the last word, it is a passion. What's the number one skill of a data scientist? Storytelling. Storytelling. <laughs> and to be a good storyteller. <laughs> it is not technical skills. It's communication skills. And at some point being classically trained in communication and leading some of these efforts, it doesn't fit in curriculum today. We have got to help ourselves communicate effectively and storytelling is is the key thank you all for your time and attention i i hope this was good thank my the panelists great job